Hi, everyone. I'm John Helveston, and I'm going to talk today about a package I developed called CBC Tools, uh, which is an R package for designing and testing choice-based conjoint surveys in R. Designing a CBC survey is challenging. There's a lot of different trade-offs uh, you have to consider, and each of them are going to affect your ability to identify uh, the effects you're interested in. Uh, so for example, you might have to consider what are the attributes and levels I actually want to show people in my survey? What's the sample size I can expect for this survey? Uh, how many choice questions am I going to show each person? And how many alternatives am I going to include in each question? You might also consider changing the way the design is shown, like using a label design. All of these factors uh, affect your ability to identify effects. And so we use tools like the design of experiment to look at things like orthogonality, balance and overlap in your attributes. Uh, and there's a long history here and a lot of literature on how to use those sorts of metrics to assess uh, your design. We also want to consider, though, how all of these features affect the user experience. We don't want to show people uh, combinations of attributes that are implausible or don't make sense. And we also want to be sensitive to respondent fatigue. If we overload our respondent by showing them too many questions or too many alternatives in each question, it might be difficult for them to answer those choice questions. So let's just take a quick example of some trade-offs you might uh, have experienced in designing a choice survey. So here's a really simple example about cars. I have three different brands and three different price uh, levels. And I created a randomized design using just nine choice sets with three questions, um, three alternatives per question. If I look at my balance, the, the number of questions shown uh, for each attribute level, I can see that my price is balanced. I show each level of price the same amount of times, but my brand is a little off balance. I'm not showing Ferrari as much as I'm showing GM and BMW. Now, if I look at the pairwise counts, things look even worse. In fact, I never show any Ferraris at $100,000, which is, in fact, the price I would expect the most. And I wouldn't expect to ever really see a Ferrari at $20,000. So there's definite issues with uh, this design. And this is just the effect of using very few choice sets. Um, when I use a limited number of choice sets, I have a, a, a fewer options of how I can combine them uh, to show a, a good design. So if I just increase that to 90, now things start to look a lot better. My balance looks a lot better on, um, on each individual uh, attribute. And if I look at pairwise counts, uh, they look a lot better. I'm at least now seeing uh, each combination. However, this uh, still may not make a lot of sense to people. You know, you're not going to see a lot of $100,000 GMs, and you're also going to not expect to see a lot of $20,000 Ferraris. So some of these are probably still um, a little illogical, and I would not say this is a, this is a good design. Uh, one other thing you might do is then look at a de-efficient design, right? And specifically a Bayesian de-efficient design, where you can set priors on what you expect the uh, utility parameters to be. So for this one, I've set these priors for my brand, where I prefer BMW to GM and Ferrari the most. And I've set some priors for price where I prefer my lower price uh, values to my higher ones. Uh, and if I do that, I get, again, good balance on individual parameters. And now my pairwise counts look a lot more logical. I'm actually never going to show a GM that's at $100,000. And most of my Ferraris are going to be the $100,000 range. And there's a lot fewer uh, at this low price range. So. There's a lot of different things I've already thought about in just this very simple example to try to whittle down to a design that hopefully will make more sense for the respondent and give me more information. And in fact, because I'm using a de-efficient design, I'm focusing the information on these main effects. And you can see this when you compare it with a randomized design. So what I'm showing here is a model that I estimated at different subsets of my data, all right? So as I go across my x-axis, I'm increasing my sample size. And you're seeing on the y-axis my standard error. So increasing my sample size brings my standard error down, which is what we would expect. And each of these plots is my different uh, parameters in my model. So I have two brand parameters, two price parameters. The blue points are a randomized design, OK? So uh, in every one of these attributes, I'm able to achieve a lower standard error 
for the same sample size compared to a randomized design. So this is a good thing. Um, using my de-efficient design, I'm going to be able to get more precision out of the same number of, of respondents. Of course, this focuses my information on main effects, which means that my interaction effects are now confounded. So if I did expect that there is some interaction between brand and price, I would not be able to identify those with the de-efficient design. So again, even though these main effects here, my de-efficient design looks really good uh, compared to my randomized one, in my interaction parameters, these four down here, I can't even identify them with the design, um, the de-efficient design. So that's yet another trade-off uh, you have to consider. Are there interaction effects that uh, do you expect to see interaction effects? Okay, so that's just one uh, small example, but there's even other things you might wanna consider. Like, what if I add just one more choice question uh, for each respondent? How would that affect my uh, standard errors? What if I increase the number of alternatives per question? You know, if I show people just two different cars instead of three different cars, how would that affect my outcomes? What if I used a label design? So what if I took the brand, for example, and showed uh, GM, BMW, and Ferrari as the label for my three questions, and I held that fixed for every design? And what if there's interaction effects, all right? So these are all other considerations I, I might be thinking about, and I wanna know how is that going to affect my outcomes? So this package, the CBC tools package, uh, was designed so that we can help answer a lot of those questions through an iterative process. Um, the package follows uh, this sort of workflow from designing my attributes and my levels, creating all the profiles uh, for those combinations of attributes, generating an initial design, being able to inspect that design, looking at things like balance and overlap, simulating choices uh, for that design so I can either randomly do it or uh, simulate choices according to a utility model. And then finally assessing power. So looking at my ability to identify effects. And there is a separate function for each of these steps. Um, each of them start with this CBC underscore. And I did that because if you're using uh, our studio uh, and you start typing CBC, you'll see something like this pop up. So you can see all the functions there all in one place and you can sort of see the help uh, information that tells you what that function does. So I'm going to walk through each of these functions uh, and sort of show you how I'm using this package uh, and the different things you can uh, get out of it. And we're going to start with just defining our basic attributes and levels. So the first thing uh, is you want to define this using a list structure. This is a uh, structure in R called a list where you define the attributes uh, with the name over here on the left and you set that equal to all of the different levels. So if they're numeric, like a price here, uh, it's going to eventually we'll model this as a continuous variable. If you wanted these to be categorical, you need to put them in quotes to make them a character type uh, like we have here. So for type, I have three different types. And for freshness, I have three different levels of freshness. So this is a, a simple conjoint about apples. So I've got three apple types and um, three levels of freshness. OK, and if I type this into R, uh, now I have this object called levels. If you print it out, it would look like this. This is just R's way of showing you, here's the information that you've, you've told me. Now I can use those levels to generate my profiles. All right, so the CBC profiles function, I hand it this levels um, object, and I get back a profiles object. The profiles object is uh, a data frame, it looks like this. Um, it's basically like a matrix or a, you know, a, a structure that has rows and columns. Um, the head function shows me the first six rows. The tail shows me the last uh, six rows. So you can sort of see it's a long uh, structure. I, I have each row uh, is a different unique profile ID, which is a combination of price, type, and freshness. And I have 63 total possible combinations from the levels that I've defined. All right, so that's all this function does is it just gives you all of the, uh, the full factorials, basically, of all the different um, combinations you have. If I wanted to have some attribute specific levels, I could also define that in my levels. So here I've got price and freshness the same as I had before. But for type, I now have a nested list uh, where I can define for each of these types a subset of, of price and freshness. So for example, Fuji apples, I only want the price range to be between two and three dollars. For Gala apples, I want it to be between one and two. And for Honeycrisp, it goes from 2.5 to four. And I never want to show any poor uh, Honeycrisp apples. Okay, so only excellent and average. 
So this is a, uh, an extended way of defining my levels. And if I did it this way, and then I went back and used CBC profiles, I would get a different subset where those, uh, where only these combinations are included. So here I only have 26 because I've been more restrictive um, on what uh, combinations I want to be able to show. Okay, now that I have some profiles, I have to create a design. So CBC design is the main function for generating a, a basic design. Uh, I give it my profiles and I set some basic uh, parameters. So how many respondents do I want to have uh, take my survey? How many alternatives am I going to show in each choice question? So this one's going to show three alternatives per question. And how many questions do I want to show each person? So in this survey, I'm only showing six per respondent. Um, by default, it generates a randomized design. And the design looks like this. Um, this is actually very similar to the way that Sawtooth uh, stores its design profiles, uh, where each row is an alternative. So the first three rows is my first choice question. Uh, I have a lot of different identifiers here. Um, this is the re identifier for each individual on my survey. This is the identifier for the question uh, for that person. So for question one, and, and the next three rows are question two. This is the alternative I'm showing everyone, uh, one, two, three. This is the unique observation ID. So this goes from one up to N, the total number of observations. And this is the profile ID. So these are the profiles uh, where I took these, uh, these rows from. So I can always go back to my profiles data frame and see uh, for this question, you know, those are my three profiles. And you can see the, uh, the attributes there, price type uh, and freshness. So that's how the design um, is structured. And there's a lot of different other features we have in uh, CBC design. So for example, if you wanna include a no choice option or a outside good where the respondent can say, no, uh, I would choose none of these, you just set no choice equal to true. Uh, and what that's gonna do is it's gonna insert a fourth option here uh, where I have the same first three and my fourth option is the outside good. And so at the very end here, you see no choice and that takes a one and everything else is zero. So when you do this, the categorical variables like type and freshness get uh, dummy coded by default um, so that everything is properly coded with the, uh, the no choice option. You can also create a labeled design. Um, most people often refer to this as an alternative specific design. Uh, here I'm using type as the label. So what you get here is each of the types, Fuji, Gala, and Honeycrisp, uh, they're always going to be shown in that order. So you're always going to see uh, those three for each choice question. So you see it here for the first three rows. Of the next choice question, it's the exact same order, Fuji, Gala, Honeycrisp. Um, so that's how you can implement a alt-specific design. And then finally, you can also use uh, a Bayesian de-efficient de design like I showed earlier. And you do that by setting priors here. You set a list of priors where you set your utility parameters that you expect for uh, a basic logit model. And it will uh, select rows according uh, to create a de-efficient design according to those uh, priors. Now, this yet is not uh, included yet. So if you ran this code, it would not actually run this. It would just return a, a randomized design. Uh, but what I'm implementing, uh, once I implement this, it's actually going to be a wrapper around this other package called IDE fix. Uh, this package is a much more expansive package that has a lot of different options for creating uh, Bayesian D efficient designs. So uh, for the meantime, if you want to create one of those, I would go to that package, uh, but this will be in there soon, this, uh, this feature. And of course, you can always just import a design, right? If you wanted to do all of that design work inside Sawtooth, you know, generate your profiles, uh, uh, generate different designs. You can export them as CSVs and import them to R and then use uh, the remaining functions in this package to inspect those designs. All right, so once we've got a design, uh, either by using this or Sawtooth or however you have created it, we can use the, these functions to uh, start to assess uh, that design. So the first two are just looking at balance and overlap. Uh, CBC balance of a design prints out information like this, where you see the counts of how many questions were shown uh, for each attribute level. So this one looks pretty balanced for the individual attributes. Uh, and you'll also see pairwise counts. So here I'm showing price and type, and you can see that they're all pretty balanced. This is a randomized design I'm showing, so you would expect it to be uh, fully balanced. You'll also see pairwise counts for uh, price and freshness and type and freshness, but uh, I'm just showing the one here. 
CBC overlap uh, shows you the overlap in each question. So this one takes a little bit uh, adjustment to get used to what it's showing, but these numbers are showing the number of questions with n unique levels. All right, so take price, for example. There's 31 questions where there's only one unique price. That means that for those 31 questions, uh, the price level is the same for all three attributes, um, all three alternatives. Uh, this one is actually the most. You're seeing that most of my questions have three different prices. Um, so there's not a lot of overlap in those questions. For type and freshness, the most I see is two. So the majority of my questions are going to have only two different types, meaning that there's at least some overlap in one of the levels of type uh, and freshness. Okay. Uh, now that I've checked my, my balance, my overlap, I can simulate choices and then uh, use that, uh, that simulated choice data to assess my, my power, my ability to uh, identify effects. Um, so CBC choices will, uh, when you hand it to design and you tell it the uh, observation ID column, it's going to tack on a new column called choice that has just ones and zeros in it that uh, are a simulated choice. So by default, it randomizes uh, the choices. So for this first question, the first choice uh, was chosen. From an X question, alternative three was chosen. So that's what uh, the result looks like. Um, and of course, you can simulate them according to a prior, uh, where I give it a list of my different utility, um, utility parameters, uh, my prior beliefs of what I expect these to be, and it will fill out the choices according to that uh, utility model. So for interpretation here, this, these coefficients over here mean uh, this. So I'm modeling price as a single continuous parameter with this utility. Uh, my type is set where Fuji is zero. I prefer Gala even more and I prefer Honeycrisp the most. And then for freshness, uh, zero is the middle point, meaning average. And I have a negative utility for poor and a positive utility for excellent. Um, so the reason it's in this order is because it's uh, you need to fill these out alphabetically. All right. So uh, average, excellent, poor is my alphabetical order. So I want to set my utilities in that order. So I'm only going to put the 0.1 and negative 0.2 here because the zero is the uh, the reference level. So that's how those values are are put into my prior list. And if I run this, I'll get uh, it'll look the same. I'll just have another choice column, but the ones and zeros are not random. They're according to a, a predefined utility model. And I can specify uh, more flexible models. If I wanted to have, for example, a mixed logit model where uh, my type attribute was uh, followed a normal distribution across the population, I could do that using this rand n function. And here I have to give it the means and the variances um, for those random normals. So I have gala following a normal distribution of 0.1 with a variance of 0.5 or standard deviation of, of 0.5 and Honeycrisp following a normal with 0.2 and a bigger standard deviation of one. And then finally, I can also include interactions, right? If I wanted to have a interaction between let's say price and type, I would just say price times type in quotes. And again, I would have to give it the uh, utility values I expect for those interactions here. Um, so that's what I've done here. Okay, and then finally, once I've got all my choice data, uh, CBC Power is going to estimate a variety of models and show me uh, the standard errors I can expect on each of those models. So CBC Power, the way this works is I have to tell it how many breaks I want. And what this is going to do is take my data set and it's going to break it up into that many chunks. So if I had a thousand respondents, if I set 10 breaks, what it's going to do is create 10 data sets. Um, the first is going to use the first 100. Uh, the next one's going to use the, the first 200, the next 300, the 400, and so on. And it's doing that so that I can see as I increase my sample size, what is the effect on standard error? OK, so I set my breaks. I hand it my data, and I tell it how many questions there are per, uh, per person. Uh, I have to tell it the observation ID as well as the choice variable. Uh, where, what's the outcome variable? This is uh, the choices that were being made. And then my parameters I want to include in my model. So here it's price, type, and freshness. And if I do this, uh, this is what I get back. My power is, again, a, another data frame structure. And at the top of it, you can see at low sample sizes here of just 30, 
Uh, and as I go through it, my sample size increases. Here at the, at the end, I have the, the 300 people. And for each of these, you can see the co model coefficients, the estimates, and their standard errors. And so you'll be able to see that, of course, uh, with just 30 people, I have some pretty high standard errors. But with 300, they're a lot lower. All right, so this is going to help me understand at what sample size do I need to achieve a certain level of precision. Um, you can look at it this way just by looking at the table, or you can say plot of my power. And if you do that, you'll get a visual like this that shows you that same information, but visually, which is a little bit easier to tell. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to stay under a standard errors of 0.1, it looks like I'm going to need around 150 people for all of my parameters to be under that threshold. Um, and of course, just like before, if I wanted to include interactions or I wanted to have a mixed logit model, I could use that rand n function. So I can specify a, a variety of different models. Um, and here I'm just showing the interaction example where now it's um, a lot harder to identify these type parameters. Um, so I'm going to need a larger sample size um, to identify them. So I might go back. Uh, to way earlier when I was designing my survey, increase my sample size, and then rerun this analysis to see where this curve uh, takes me, uh, to see what sample size I might need to identify those. Um, so that's the basic package um, as of today. Uh, there's a few more features I'm working on. Like I said, creating a Bayesian de-efficient design is not yet implemented. Um, but there's a lot of different places for Sawtooth in particular to interact with this. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to do that first design process inside Sawtooth, you wanted to use Sawtooth's uh, algorithms to identify different types of designs, you could create multiple designs, export them as CSV files, and then import those into R. And once you're in R, you can then use these other tools to do things like simulate choices and assess power for very specific models, okay? So you, you don't just have to use a null model, you can specify interactions, mixed logit models, um, and uh, a, a variety of different um, types of models to assess power. Um, and then likewise, you could also just do this entire process in R, and once you're done, you've, you've got a design that you're happy with, uh, you can export that as a CSV and import that into Sawtooth to go field your survey. Um, so, uh, for example, the, the, the way that the design is structured, where every row is an alternative, that follows the same structure that Sawtooth software uses. So it should be a pretty smooth uh, uh, process just to import that directly in and go field your surveys. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, thanks for your attention. The uh, package software uh, documentation is here on my GitHub. Uh, this is the software documentation where you can see this particular example if you wanted to implement it. Um, the code itself is also available on GitHub. It is all open source, so you can go back and uh, check my code. Uh, if you have any issues, you can always file an issue, and I'm happy to um, address it. And this uh, is a link to my slides. My slides themselves are actually also built in R, so if you're curious how I do that to make these interactive slides, you can go there. Uh, thanks, and I look forward to hearing your feedback.